Helen Caster is a medieval historian and one of the few members of her trade you're likely to have heard of. Her last project was a book and three-part television series called She Wolves, about the handful of women who tried to rule England as queens in the medieval era. Her latest is called Joan of Arc, A History, in which she retells the story of the maid in man's clothing who in 1429 led the French to a series of improbable military victories against English invaders until she was captured tried and burnt at the stake by the English in 1431. Helen Caster, for those who have perhaps only the haziest notion of who Joan of Arc was <laughs> and what she did, just very briefly remind us of the sort of arc of her career. Joan of Arc was one of the most extraordinary figures in medieval history. Early 15th century France was experiencing uh, an appalling period of crisis at war with England and also divided on itself in a civil war. And in 1429, Joan of Arc appeared as if from nowhere, a peasant girl, probably about 17 years old, declaring that she'd been sent by God to drive the English out of France and restore the rightful king to the throne, which she did, sort of. Uh, at least she drove the English away from Orléans, which they'd been besieging for months, and she led her king, the leader of one half of the French, uh, to his coronation at Reims. And after that, the wheels came after off. After that, the wheels came off, yes. She was captured, uh, tried for heresy in Rouen by the opposing lot of French and the English, and then burned. Now, the historian today is fortunate because she's one of the very few people in the Middle Ages about whom, uh, other than perhaps uh, kings and queens, about whom there is a, a, a con considerable written record because the English tried her and they took copious notes of all the interrogations and the trial proceedings. And then a few years later, the French, after her death to rehabilitate her, staged a sort of anti-trial and we've got the records of that too. We have. They are extraordinary documents. We have pages and pages and pages of testimony, including testimony of Joan herself. It's extraordinary. And of course, after that, she went on to become a legendary figure in France. We were looking for some stills of Joan of Arc to illustrate this interview. And what we found was almost all kind of romantic 19th century images of the sort of chivalric character, um, uh, I mean, tremendously attractive um, and a, a kind of national heroine, but um, the real Joan somehow rather get, gets lost in all of that. The real she? Joan gets completely lost. It, it is extraordinary. The myth-making began almost as soon as she appeared and then certainly gathered pace after her death. And every age has remade Joan in its own image and for its own ends. And she was a, a difficult, a spiky character um, who clearly had in, immense charisma, tremendous impact on her contemporaries, in, including right up to the, 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 the King of France. Um, but she's difficult for us to get a handle on because absolutely central to her story is her religious visions which drove her on and the way the, the societies in which she was operating responded to that. I mean, the, the medieval approach to religion is something that we have quite some difficulty as modern people understanding. I think we do and I think sometimes it's seen as though Joan brought God into this war and that was one of her great powers that she said, I'm bringing God's will to work here. Actually, the people of the Middle Ages saw God's will at work everywhere. And one of the things we have to understand is that France was struggling with uh, its sense of itself as God's chosen people, the, the great Christian kingdom. And yet it was riven with division and, and war. How could these things be? So for Joan to bring a message from God that accorded with that sense that God might intervene in the world when all seemed lost was very, very powerful. Um, Although I think one of the things that's happened since I finished writing the book um, at the beginning of the year, actually, is a, a, a resonance watching the news that actually the power of unbending religious faith, uncompromising religious faith in warfare is something that's beginning to seem more directly real to us even here in the, in the I was otherwise going to ask you about West. that. It's not too simple to, to draw connections between that medieval approach to religious war and what's happening now in the Middle East with ISIS so and so on. I don't think so at all. If, if um, one lives in a world where God's hand intervenes and God's voice speaks uh, and that is the rule that one must follow,
then there's no room for compromise. And Joan's story is really the story of two truths that are incompatible coming together. The truth that she sees that God is on her side and the truth that her prosecutors, her enemies see that God can't possibly be on her side because he's on their side. Something's got to give and that's why Joan has to die. Now you used to be an academic historian, fellow of Sydney, Sussex, Cambridge. You were um, a, a, a teacher and an academic and you switched. So you're still a professional historian, but you're yeah. a popular historian. You write books for a general audience. Why did you want to do that? I found that I wanted to write books in a rather different way. I didn't want to abandon any of the rigour, the training, the discipline that I got from my academic life. Uh, but I wanted to write narrative history. Susanna Lipscomb, who's another popular historian, wrote recently that you have to make a choice if you're writing history between, as she said, she put it, being Scheherazade, telling a really good tale, but possibly over uh, finessing some of the complexities and being, as she put it, Hercule Poirot, where you say these are the clues, these are the, 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 the process by which I reached my conclusion. Now, the first of those appeals to people like us, who are not general historians, but the latter actually surely is more honest to the difficulties of writing any kind of history. That's certainly true, but what I'm aiming for is to do both. Um, th there are extensive pages of notes at the end of this book where I'm precisely doing my Hercule Poirot bit. Uh, I hope showing my working, showing why I've come to the conclusions I've come to. But I hope there's an honesty and an integrity too to the narrative part of the book because I as a historian have to make those decisions. I have to decide which sources to follow, which accounts, which, which balancing of evidence I find most convincing. Uh, very briefly, your last project was She Will, was a book and a three-part television series which was explicitly feminist. It was about those women in the Middle Ages who tried effectively to rule, make, tried and largely failed, uh, to effectively to rule England as queens. Now, this is a book about another remarkable medieval woman. Uh, to what extent, if at all, is Joan of Arc a, a model for or someone who modern feminists ought to know about and, and consider? I, I think she's someone that modern people ought to know about and consider. Her role as a feminist icon is extraordinarily interesting. Um, as in almost other area of life, she's been used as a role model by both sides in the debate. You'll find conservative Catholic newspapers saying she's the scourge of modern feminism and you, the suffragettes marched dressed as Joan of Arc uh, um, uh, in, in the early 1900s. She really is the exception to every rule. She wasn't that keen on having other women around herself. Uh, she's not unlike some other great figures, Elizabeth I, Margaret Thatcher perhaps, uh, who, weren't, who, who were keener on being the exception than the start of a, a wave, as it were. Um, but I think a woman who does something that should have been impossible is always worth looking at. Ellen Custer, thank you very much indeed.